Welcome to the Global Marketing Show, the podcast for all things international business. I'm your host, Wendy Pease, president of Rapport International and a translation expert. Come along with me today as we talk to an expert in the global marketing world about facing their biggest fears, hearing about mistakes they made or saw, discussing best practices, and sharing fun travel language and culture story. Hello, listeners. Thanks for joining the Global Marketing Show podcast. And today we are welcoming Dr. Michael Drews. He grew up in Chicago. He got his PhD in Iowa. He lived in Massachusetts for most of his distinguished professional career. And he recently moved to San Diego because there's no snow. So we are recording this while there's still snow on the ground out here in Boston. So just tell me, how is it in San Diego? Everything you dreamed of? It's it's wonderful out here. Yeah, my wife and I are extremely fortunate to, to be living out here in Southern California. Thank you for asking, Wendy. And thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion today with you and your audience. Oh, it is my pleasure. I am so looking forward to getting into a lot of the international regulatory uh, questions that people come across when they think about expanding. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and what your history is, and then we'll get into some of the fun questions. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so basically, Wendy, my background is in biomedical engineering. That's what my PhD is in. Uh, I started out in this business almost 30 years ago as an R&D engineer, I, su- I suppose before you were born, uh, before transitioning to the dark side, in my case, not uh, marketing, but regulatory. And so I spend uh, the bulk of my professional time helping a variety of medical device uh, uh, companies bring devices through the FDA and onto the market here in the United States, as well as uh, around the world. And uh, just one or two other things I would point out briefly about myself, in addition to consulting for companies, I also work as a consultant for the FDA, as well as Health Canada and some of the other regulatory agencies. And as you can probably imagine, Wendy, there's not a lot of people that can say that, that play on both sides of that proverbial fence. And I really, really try to use that to my advantage. Um, I teach part-time. I'm currently teaching at uh, Cornell uh, in their graduate department of biomedical engineering. I teach a course called Medical Device Regulatory Affairs for Biomedical Engineers and a similar course at George Washington University in their Master's of Regulatory Science program on medical device regulatory affairs and strategy. And then uh, just the, the last one or two things very quickly about myself. In addition to all of that, I'm a contributing editor to several very large medical technology and regulatory publications. So I'm constantly putting out a lot of podcasts and webinars and columns on a wide variety of different topics. I would encourage you and your audience to just Google my name if you want. Uh, You'll come up with lots and lots of different things. And then the very last thing uh, I'll mention is in addition to all of that, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. I'm involved in starting or helping to start a, a variety of medical technology companies. Let's see, currently sitting on the board of uh, four, soon to be five of them. So at a high level, Wendy, that's a little bit about how I spend my time and kind of how we got to this conversation today. I I am just so impressed with what you do. And you made such a good point about being on both sides, a consultant for the FDA and them working for companies. That gives you such a good, good view of what needs to happen and how and what the both sides are looking for that I get I bet few people get that opportunity yeah I really I really think so uh you know I don't want to go so far as to say that's a unique perspective but it's certainly an uncommon perspective and just as a quick example anytime that I go to the FDA with a company to uh to present a product in a pre-submission meeting for example before I go I always put myself in the shoes of the FDA reviewer in mm-hmm. other words, if I was the reviewer on that particular product, what questions would I ask? What concerns would I have? Uh, that's, you know, when you think about it, Wendy, it kind of sounds obvious, you know, kind of sounds, you know, very basic, but it's amazing how, how few people really um, stop and, and consider what does it look like from the other side of the fence? What are some of the questions that you see companies missing that they don't think about that the FDA would be asking about? Like, what what kinds of issues would that be? 
Well, you know, that's a good question. It's a little hard to answer in sort of a general or a ubiquitous sense, but um, just to, to continue the conversation, let me share with you one of my experiences that I see fairly frequently when I'm sitting on the FDA side of the table. And that is, it's amazing to me how many people and how many companies come into the FDA and basically ask FDA, what do we do? How do we bring this device onto the market? What kind of testing do we have to do and so on? And as you can imagine, Wendy, that's a terrible strategy for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, it's uh, not FDA's job to tell us what to do. It's our job as medical device professionals to figure out what to do. That is what makes sense from a biology and engineering perspective and then go to the FDA and sell it to them. The other reason why I think it's a terrible strategy is because you're opening up a Pandora's box and you have no idea what you're going to get in return. In other words, if you go into the FDA, for example, and, and ask the question, do I need to do a clinical trial for my new product? What do you think they're going to say? Of course, yes. you're going to do a clinical trial and you're going to use 10 million patients, right? Obviously, I'm being a bit facetious to emphasize the point. But uh, so, so I've developed over the almost 30 years that I've been playing this game, one of my regulatory mantras, and that is, tell, don't ask, lead, don't follow. In other words, go into the FDA and say, here's my device. This is what it does. This is how it works. This is how we're going to bring it onto the market as a 510K, as a de novo, as a PMA, what have you. Uh, this is the testing that we're going to do and why. This is the testing that we're not going to do and why. We are going to do a clinical trial and here's what it's going to look like and here are all the reasons why, or alternatively, we're not going to do a clinical trial and here are all the reasons why. So in other words, uh, I wanna to demonstrate to my friends on the FDA side of the table that yeah, I'll consider whatever suggestions or advice they wanna offer, but at the end of the day, this is my party, not theirs. I'm leading this show. And I think it's very important for companies to remember that although this is a collaborative relationship, uh, at the end of the day, the company is ultimately responsible for what they do as well as what they don't do, not the FDA. Does that make sense, Wendy? That makes sense a lot. I love that tell, don't ask, and then it was lead, don't follow. Correct. Tell, don't ask, lead, don't follow. Um, and in the regulatory world, as you can probably guess, Wendy, that some might consider that to be a... Uh, how should we say this, a little bit of an aggressive sort of a position. But uh, what can I say? I guess uh, I, I, I've been characterized by some as one of the more aggressive regulatory professionals out there. <laughs> so, um, you know. But, but I think you that makes sense with, if you're going to the FDA, they, you don't want to waste their time and they want to be taken through. I mean, it's very interesting to me. I mean, my background is in marketing and I worked at Parkcell. I did an internship at, at Biogen. So, you know, I've had touches through that. And the F, by the time you get to the FDA, you've got to take them through basically a buyer's journey. You know, in marketing, we call it the buyer's journey where you're yeah. introducing them, you're engaging them, and then you're delighting them. And that's exactly what you're you're telling them here is I'm going to walk you through this process that I've thought about. And you really are selling the FDA when you're in, you're in regulatory. Exactly. Uh, and I'm certainly not a sales and marketing person, but if I can take my uh, tell, don't ask, lead, don't follow met metaphor and try to apply it to sales and marketing, you as a sales or, or marketing professional are not going to go to a potential customer, I don't think, and say, oh, would you please buy my product? Instead, you're probably going to go and say, you, you definitely need to buy my product and here are all the reasons why. So uh, that's basically what I do. And it's funny, you, you mentioned selling uh, at the FDA. That's exactly the way I look at this, Wendy. When I go into the FDA, I'm selling them. I'm not selling them in the monetary sense of the word, mm -hmm. but I'm selling them on my regulatory strategy, on my testing plan and you know, so on and so on. So it is largely a sales pitch. That's really what it comes down to. Right. It's you want them to see it your way and you want to make sure you have all the questions answered and you're bringing them along the journey. So they say, yes, it's a, it's exactly. a sales process. Yeah, exactly. And I'm yeah. glad that you brought up uh, the, the, the questions issue, Wendy, because another of the techniques that I've developed over the nearly 30 years that I've been playing this game is you can't anticipate every problem or every question, but you can certainly anticipate many of them. 
And so one of the things that I do with all of my customers before we go to the FDA uh, is we will obviously develop and, pre and, and um, present our plan. Here's what we're gonna do and so on. But then we start to map out a whole bunch of different what if scenarios or contingency scenarios. In other words, what if FDA says this, then we say that. What if FDA, you know, says the other thing, then we say this thing and so on. You know, I uh, characterize uh, the entire relationship between the company and the FDA as a poker game in every sense of the word. And just because somebody understands the rules of poker doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a good poker player. And it certainly doesn't mean that you're going to win the game. I want to do everything that I can legal, of course. I don't want to be wearing any orange jumpsuits in order to win the game. In other words, you can read 50 books on the rules of poker. Does that mean that you're going to be a good poker player? Does that mean that you're going to win the game? Absolutely not. You can have two players that are holding exactly the same cards in, your, in their hand and yet one of them will win and the other will lose. So it's not just simply the cards that you have in your hand, but how do you play them? When do you play them? And, and so on. So when I say, you know, Wendy, that I characterize this relationship as a poker game, I literally mean that in every sense. And I know that, you know, primarily we're talking to an international audience here and you wanted to talk about international regulatory strategy, which is fine. But all of the basic principles that we're talking about, certainly the ones that we've mentioned thus far, the tell, don't ask, lead, don't follow, and so on and so on, all of that applies around the globe. In other words, whether you're talking to the FDA or to Health Canada or to the EU or, you know, some other regulatory bodies, you know, somewhere else, the principles, the basic philosophies still apply 100%. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And so you're, go you're going exactly where I wanted to take you next was so now you've got a medical device that you're here you've got approval in the US when do you start thinking about taking it international and so I'd love for you to take an example of a product or device or one that you worked on and when you started thinking about international and then how did that journey look Great question, Wendy. And again, thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion with you and your audience, because this is a very important topic. You, uh, whether you did this purposely or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but you sort of, um, how do you want to say, biased the question a little bit the way you phrased it. In other words, what I heard you say was you already have a device on the market here in the U.S. and now you want to expand into other parts of the, of the world. That's certainly a possible strategy. However, that's not the only strategy. So what I would suggest is you back the truck up several feet. In other words, before you bring a product onto the market anywhere, including the United States, you develop your international regulatory strategy. And here, if I can, Wendy, let me give you exactly the, the reason why I think this is so important. I see many medical device companies, they'll bring, including some of the largest medical device companies on earth. And when this happens to them, I just laugh because it's such an elementary school mistake. I see them bring a product onto the market in one place in the world. And then they go on to the next place and they find out that the next place wants, to, wants a piece of information that the first place didn't want. And now they have to do maybe some additional testing again. Maybe they have to do a whole clinical trial over again in order to collect that additional piece of information. So can you say ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching? It's amazing to me, Wendy, how, how often this happens. So the easy way to greatly mitigate, if not totally avoid, that scenario that I just described, an all-too-common scenario, is to develop as early as you can, early in the product development cycle, your international regulatory strategy. In other words, and I'm going to describe this, you know, sort of at a high level, obviously, um, identify the first three or four or five places in the world that you want to bring your product onto the market. Please don't tell me that you're going to bring your product onto the market, you know, in every country in the world from day one, because that just ain't going to happen. But identify the first three or four or perhaps five places and then pool those regulatory requirements. In other words, identify all of the requirements necessary to bring the product on to the market into all of those three or four places, and then design your development plan, whether it's benchtop testing, in some cases animal testing, or in some cases clinical testing, such that you collect all, all of that information to satisfy the requirement that one step further, obviously the focus of our conversation today is on the regulatory side. 
but let's not forget reimbursement. Uh, what I suggest also is to develop your international reimbursement strategy in a similar way, such that you collect all of that information that you'll need for reimbursement reasons uh, or health economic reasons um, here in the US as well as in your other countries as well. So regulatory obviously is very important, no question about it, but it is only one piece of the puzzle and there are other pieces of the puzzle, but I just wanted to uh, at least bring it up for your audience here. Don't just consider the your international regulatory strategy early in the product development process, but also start to consider your uh, reimbursement strategy early in that process as well. I've seen it happen, including to some of the largest medical device companies on earth. Well, they'll get a product onto the market. For example, they get it through the FDA only to come to find that because it doesn't existing reimbursement code, nobody can use it because nobody can buy it because nobody can pay for it. And so not only does the company not make any money, but no, no, no patients are, are benefited either. So there are, regrettably, Wendy, there, there are some fundamental mistakes, and some of them can be quite timely and, and, cost, uh, and, and costly as well, some fundamentally, uh, fundamental mistakes that people make that, in my opinion, are, uh, are, are largely, uh, largely avoidable. You answered that question so perfectly. I did kind of set you up with you have this product in the United States and then you think about going to the U.S. because so often I hear about medical, you know, life sciences companies doing that and not thinking. And I see it in the technology industry, too. Oh, we'll build this. Oh, now we're going international. Well, the platform won't handle the fonts or the language or, you know, multiple languages or so many mistakes that they can make. So I'm so glad that you said that. And in there, you said that, you know, you think of your three, four or five different places that you'd go. What tend to be good markets? How would people think about picking the additional markets they're going to? Well, again, great question. Little difficult question to answer in sort of a general sense, but let me give it a try. Uh, you and I suspect many in your audience are at least generally aware that in the EU, when it comes to medical device regulation, the entire EU is in a huge state of flux, and that's putting it mildly. There's this whole new set of um, what are called uh, EU MDRs that are coming into effect. Um, and, and this has been in transition for the last couple of years. And once again, this is a topic of a completely different conversation for you know those in the audience. I've done some webinars on this topic. And coincidentally, next week, I'm doing a presentation at an online conference on this topic. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are changing when it comes to regulation of medical devices in, in the EU. However, Wendy, I'm reminded of the French philosopher, I can't remember what his name was, the French philosopher who said, the more things change, the more they remain the same. <laughs> there are a lot of changes that are going on in the EU right now. But in my opinion, never mind as a regulatory consultant, but as a professional biomedical engineer, most of the changes are not in substance. In other words, there's a lot of paperwork changes, but not a lot in real how do you want to say, engineering terms. In other words, not a lot of changes that at the end of the day will ultimately translate into safety and effectiveness. Um, and one of the questions that I've asked, and I think we need more people asking this question, is two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, if this new regulation that's going into effect in the EU, if it does not lead ultimately to medical devices that are safer and more effective, then isn't this a colossal waste of time and money? So that's a topic of a different discussion, but coming back to your question in terms of international regulatory strategy, the conventional wisdom in the past, up until very recently, was that everything else being equal, it was easier to bring most medical devices onto the market in the EU first, and then go to the US second or, or third. But a lot of people now, because of these changes, they're really re rethinking that equation. And it's not so, how do you want to say, it's not so black or, black or white or clear cut anymore to go to the EU first or similarly to go to the US first. Um, because the requirements do differ. It really, you know, one of the things we have to remember, Wendy, uh, about the medical device universe, as opposed to, for example, drugs and biologics, the medical device universe is a very, very broad universe. 
you know, on one end of that spectrum, we have things like band-aids and wheelchairs and EKG monitors. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have things like totally implantable artificial hearts. So it's a little hard to, you're, you're asking some great questions, but it's a little hard to, to, to generalize, to respond in, a, in sort of a ubiquitous sense, because obviously there's going to be differences if you're developing a Band-Aid or an artificial heart. And that's one of the many differences, if you will, between the medical device world versus drugs or biologics. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I have heard that before. And in, in, in some of the things that are classified as medical devices are kind of unusual, too, that you wouldn't think that they're general, like a Band-Aid over-the-counter products that you can just buy. Yeah. So EU and US seem um, like the top two markets to go into. Then what do you think about the Russias and Chinas and Brazil's well, the big, big so, other markets. So in sort of, um, at least from my experience, uh, Wendy, uh, usually the, the, the countries that companies want to go into first are no surprise, the big economic ones like the US, like the EU, like Japan, like Canada. <clears throat> when it comes to some of the other countries that you mentioned, for example, you mentioned Russia. In many ways, Russia is still sort of the wild, wild west when it comes to medical device regulation. Um, Asia, uh, whether you're talking about in China, dealing with the CFDA, the, the Chinese FDA, or the KFDA, the Korean FDA, there are differences. You know, there, uh, again, it's, it's hard to, to generalize. Incidentally, I find it interesting how in some places of the world, and this is just a personal observation for whatever it's worth, Wendy, countries like to align themselves closely with the U.S. So, for example, I mentioned the CFDA, the Chinese FDA, or the KFDA, the Korean FDA. However, in other places of the world, like my friends in Ottawa at Health Canada, they hate it. They despise when I refer to them as the Canadian FDA. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't, uh, because this is obviously a recorded podcast, you know, I won't go into the reasons as to why that is, but I, I, I think you and your audience can, can guess. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I can certainly of course, guess. Of that. course, That's Wendy, you, you, of course, you would be the first to agree that there's no politics in regulation, right? <laughs> <laughs> And it amazes me, by the way, just as a side note, it amazes me how many people try to separate regulation from politics when, to me, that makes absolutely no sense because where does the regulation come from? It comes from the politicians. So right. regulation and politics, whether you're talking about here in the U.S. or anyways, anywhere else in the world, they're intimately related to one another. That's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a thing. It is a fact, something that we have to consider, something that we have to try to understand in order to ultimately make the world a better place, which is ultimately my goal. Yes. So speaking of a better place, humor is always very fun <laughs> in international stuff. What are some of the funny stories that you've seen in international regulatory areas? That's an interesting question, Wendy. That, uh, funny stories, I guess, I'm not sure if this would be considered funny or not because some of these things can ultimately cost companies a lot of time and money, but certainly when it comes to communication, uh, around the world. Obviously, people speak different languages <clears throat> and, you know, translating information from one language to another can be challenging. And I don't mean just literally transmitting from word, tra translating from word to word, but in terms of the meaning, you know, the meanings can be, um, uh, speaking of communication, I can't think of the right English word, but the, the, the meaning might not be translated properly, even though the words may be translated properly. In addition to that, there are cultural differences. I'm sure you know you and your audience are probably more aware of some of these things than I am. For example, in some places, you know, it's customary to shake hands when you meet somebody. In other places, it's not. In some places, and I have this, uh, this experience um, in my teaching, both in industry as well as in academia, uh, in some places of the world, students are encouraged to ask questions. 
where, uh, and, and I love that approach, by the way, I think one of the most important skills of a good regulatory professional, and notice I'm not just saying a regulatory professional, but a good one, uh, is asking questions and especially asking the questions that either other people don't want to ask, or maybe in some cases are afraid to ask. So in some places in the world, um, uh, like here in the U.S., for example, people are, are encouraged to ask questions, whether, whereas, <clears throat> pardon me, in other places in the world, people are actually discouraged from asking questions. As a matter of fact, I've been told in, in some places in the world that it can be a sign of disrespect mm -hmm. if you ask a professor, for example, a question. And I don't know, maybe this is just me, Wendy, but I can't see how anybody can construe that as a sign of disrespect. On the contrary, I love it when people ask me questions and especially questions that I can't answer because that gives mm -hmm. me an opportunity to learn something. So I don't know if those are like funny stories, uh, but those are, you know, stories about uh, the challenges of doing business, uh, probably not just, you know, in the medical world, but doing business in any industry around the world when you're dealing with 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 language differences, with cultural differences, with political differences, with sometimes psychological differences. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this poker game indeed. Okay, so you know I'm not gonna let you off without giving me some funny translation words. Do you have any specific examples? This is my thing, I love hearing these. And I know we can get a chuckle out of them, but I always do have a lot of respect and, you know, for the companies and, and I uh, feel bad for them that they've gone through this um, because it can cause a lot of issues. But some of the some of it is just funny because of the difference of languages. Well, I'm not sure that I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I can give you a specific answer to your question about a. a, a but I but I will say this on a more serious note. Um, doing business, you know, a, 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 around the world, it causes challenges in terms of communication because of language and so on. But I got to believe, Wendy, that in some cases, there is even more fundamental challenges than that. Uh, in other words, I read documents in English that, uh, to me, don't make any sense. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't make any sense. In, in other words, I get drafts from my customers of documents uh, to read before we submit them to the, NDA, to the FDA, for example. Some of them are written quite well. Some of them literally are painful to read. In other words, it's like, do they teach kids in school anymore how to construct a sentence with a, with a noun and a verb and so on? I, I wonder. You're laughing, but I'm serious. I wonder. So at that level, you know, um, uh, it can be a challenge. But even more problematic to me, sometimes I read things that don't make sense from an engineering or a biology perspective. So the challenges that we were just talking about in terms of translating um the underlying assumption there is that the information that we're actually transmit translating is correct to begin with and that's not always the case yes yes i actually i have a book coming out on the language of global marketing to help people with this and there's a whole chapter on global english and it's not, English is not the global language. You need to take that into account. But one of the major things is write well in the original source language, because if you don't have that well written, you can't get the, me the, the message across in any other language. Absolutely. So it's so true. And I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to language or linguistics, linguistics but one thing that I have learned is uh, here in the United States, we don't speak English. We speak American. Yes. There's a difference. What, <laughs> what the Brits speak is English. What the, the Scottish and the Welsh speak, they, they claim to speak English, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> 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 and obviously, you know, you asked about, uh, you know, funny stories in terms of translation. Obviously, there are, you know, interesting differences between English versus American in terms of words and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, communication, um, and, and this is a challenge that a lot of companies face. Communication is one of the biggest challenges that I see in the regulatory world and in the, the medical technology world. One of the things that I've learned in being married, Wendy, and I have to be a little careful what I say here, but I can say one thing and my wife can hear something completely different. 
Mm. And I'm sure the women in our audience are probably, you know, uh, some of them are laughing and some of them are about ready to hit me in the face. I'm not sure. But what a lot of no, people No, but I think that's right. I think no matter if your wife's saying it with a husband or, you know, you could say it about your best friend or your children. I mean, it's, it just happens correct. to show up quicker in a marriage because you're closer. Correct. But yeah. But, but here's the point that I'm trying to make. This is why I brought it up. A lot of people, you know, they, they understand that, that what I say and what my wife here, you know, may not be the same thing. Well, what they don't understand is that the same thing applies between the company and the FDA or whatever regulatory body that they happen to be dealing with. In other mm -hmm. words, the company can write or say one thing and the FDA can read or hear something completely different. Right. And I find it interesting, Wendy, that uh, so many people assume that if two parties, whether it's you and I or two organizations, a company in the FDA, if two parties are talking, that means they're communicating. And mm -hmm. I do not make that assumption. As a matter of fact, I find mm. it ironic in the uh, medical device world. We're, we're used to thinking in terms of measuring the efficacy of our products but we're not used to thinking in terms of measuring the efficacy of our communication, of our, of our regulatory submissions, for example. So I'll give you a quick example. One of the most poorly written portions of most medical device uh, submissions, in my opinion, is the device description. Why? Because the vast majority of questions that I see coming back from reviewers when they're, when they're evaluating a submission uh, the vast majority of those questions are indicative of the fact that they do not understand the device, what it does, how it works, its mechanism of action, and so on. And in my opinion, it's, incumb it's incumbent on us, the company, to make sure the FDA understands our device, not the other way around. So if they're asking all these questions about the device, how it works, to me that means that the device description is not written very well. So here's my suggestion, because one of the things I pride myself on, Wendy, is I don't want to make excuses. I don't want to come up with a hundred reasons why something doesn't work or we can't do something. I want to focus on what we can do. So measure the efficacy of your device description. In other words, take your device description, give it to somebody who is not familiar with your device, ask them to read it, and then ask them to describe to you what they just read. And if they paint a picture of something that looks like the device that you have under development, then great, you know you're communicating. But if they paint a picture that looks something like something totally different than what you have under development, or worse, if they're so confused that they can't paint a picture at all, then you know that you're not communicating. This is so basic, Wendy. I just don't understand why more people and more companies don't do this, perhaps because it's not required. And I would like to think that we would not need regulation to tell, thing, tell people to do things that what I think are common sense. But most of the regulation, when you read it, it is or it should be common sense. But anyway, I'm going off on some tangents, Wendy. I, I, I don't know if this is of interest Dr. Drews, I think that's fabulous advice because – by the time you're writing that, you're so knee deep in the product, you're getting down in the nitty gritty details, but you're, you're writing a generalized description. You're writing the elevator pitch, really, and to tell a, somebody yes. what it is. And yes. the FDA, FDA is not going to have a deep understanding of what it is. I think that's fabulous advice. Well, thank now, you. I, and to me, it's common sense. And I'll take that just a step further. Another thing that I have to constantly remind my customers when we're preparing, for example, documents to go to the FDA, I have to tell them, remember, they're not going to, sorry, the FDA is not going to have the benefit of having us, on, in other words, the company on the phone with them when they're reading the document. Uh, so the FDA reviewer is not going to say, hey, I just read this, this sentence or this paragraph. I don't really understand. Can you please explain it to me? These, we're, we're talking about some fundamental challenges with communication here. You've got to write these documents so that they're understandable, so that they're readable, kind of like a novel, obviously nonfiction. But it right. definitely should read like a novel with an introduction, a series of main points, <clears throat> a conclusion. And again, it's amazing to me when I have to recommend to my customers, and believe me, you know, I'm very fortunate my business is doing well. My customers, you know, pay me a decent amount of money. But when I have to when they have to pay me to tell them to make sure that you include an introduction and a conclusion, it's it's like <laughs> I don't know. Right. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah, because there's there's so many technical writers that are out there that could do that very cleanly. So you'd think that they'd have it edited. Now, what do you recommend for when they're going international and they need to get translation to submit it? Well, I would say that fundamentally the same principles apply. Uh, obviously, since we're here in the United States, and um, at least in my case, you know, my native language is English, and really the only speak language that I speak fluently is English. What I would suggest is that you know we build our our documentation, our regulatory submission, what have you, in English first, and make sure that all the things that I mentioned before, all the sentences have nouns and verbs, all the sections have introductions and conclusions and so on. Um, but then when it comes and, and, and get a document that is very um, well organized and, and readable in English, and then you can move on and talk about translating it to whatever other country requirements there are. For example, I mentioned the Chinese FDA earlier. In China, they have a regulatory requirement that all submissions need to be presented to them in Chinese. Okay, well, that makes sense. I mean, any country can require whatever they want. But mm -hmm. before I was gonna give a document to some sort of a translator to, to, to convert it from English to Chinese, or pardon me, from American to Chinese. <laughs> right. um, I want to make sure that my American version of the document is as 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 as, uh, as as clean as it can be, because if it's not, then I think any of those challenges that we talked about earlier are going to be amplified when you go through that translation process. Right. Exactly. So in China, you do need to have Chinese. What about the EU? Can you submit there in English, or what are their requirements for language? Yeah, for the most part, um, I, I uh, at least in my experience, uh, some countries, some regions, obviously the EU is a region as opposed to an individual country, uh, some will take documentation in English. Others, like for example, China, will want it in Chinese. But my advice is um, obviously in order to do business in these part, different parts of the world, you need to be familiar with whatever their requirements are. So that's an easy thing to find out. Mm -hmm. and you could either find that out directly or in order to do business in most other places of the world, you need a local representative, uh, a, a boots on the ground presence, as I like to describe it. So ask that person if you're not sure yourself. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those are all answerable questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, do there are step grants available from the federal and state governments that are given to companies that are going international? Do you ever see any of your clients applying for these to help with translation? Yeah, good question. That's not something that I usually get involved with, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. Uh, obviously, I work with lots of companies that do business around the world, and I do get involved in helping them develop their international regulatory strategy, as we talked about earlier in today's conversation. But in terms of how they fund that, whether it's through a, a grant or something, that I'm not sure about. Oh, okay. And so you work with the regular regulatory strategy, and then what, what do they typically do for their go-to-market strategy? Do they end sure. up higher? Do you help with that, or do you... Do they end up hiring uh, well, another expert or? Yeah, I'm, uh, so my focus is uh, all things regulatory and to, a, and to a certain extent quality as well. And with my biomedical engineering background, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I have a PhD in biomedical engineering, so I've got a good engineering background. I've also got a good medical background. So I used to teach pathophysiology in medical school back in the day. So hmm. those are the areas that I kind of focus on. But uh, and to a lesser extent, as I mentioned earlier, reimbursement, but when it comes to go-to-market strategy, for example, that's not something that I usually get involved with. One of the things that's very important in developing a regulatory strategy, whether it's here in the U.S. or somewhere else in the world, is our labeling what we want to say about our product, our claims, specifically the intended use and the indications for use. I will obviously get input from the sales and marketing folks uh, in terms of what we want to say about our product, but I'll also get input from the reimbursement side is also from the um, product liability side. 
because uh, one thing that I might mention about my work, Wendy, in addition to working as a regulatory consultant, I also spend a growing amount of my time as an expert witness in medical device product liability cases. And I can tell you that oftentimes what you want to say on a product's label from a regulatory perspective may be diametrically opposed, maybe 180 degrees out of sync from what you want to say from a reimbursement perspective or from a product liability perspective or some other kind of a perspective. So as I said earlier, obviously regulatory is an important piece of this puzzle, but it is only one piece of the puzzle. And you do have to take sort of a holistic view. You have to look at all of the different pieces, reimbursement, intellectual pro property, product liability, um, the, the sales and marketing, all these other kinds of things, and put them together, put all the pieces of the puzzle together, hopefully in a way that makes sense. Right, right. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so we're getting down towards the end of the hour, but I am so fascinated. How did you get into regulatory and then international regulatory? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Wendy. It's not like uh, I woke up one morning and said, today I'm going to be a regulatory consultant. Not, not at all. <laughs> no, uh, none of them do. No <laughs> regulatory people do. But <laughs> um, Well, I mean, long story short, uh, you know, as I said earlier, my background is in biomedical engineering. I started out as an R&D engineer. Um, and uh, I guess I, I gradually sort of got into more and more on the, the regulatory side. But I got to say this, Wendy, I, and this is my background, so obviously I'm, I'm biased here. I think for me, having a background in engineering, especially biomedical engineering, and having my medical background on top of that, as I said, teaching pathophysiology in, in medical school, that is a huge advantage in regulatory. And let me tell you exactly why. I see a lot of folks, um, uh, they begin with the regulation first. And in my opinion, that has that's a huge mistake. That has disaster written all over it in every language. There's an adage that I used to say to my medical students, perhaps you've heard this before. The surgery went perfectly, but the patient died anyway. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but it's true. The The engineering equivalent of that is we designed the medical device perfectly, and yet the patient died anyway. The regulatory equivalent of that is we followed the regulation perfectly. That is, we did all that FDA or Health Canada or whoever asked us to do, and yet the patient died anyway. Unfortunately, Wendy, these things happen more frequently than some people would like to think. And I think the, the real reason, the root cause, to use the engineering vernacular, the root cause is that a lot of people, they begin with the regulation first, and I don't take that approach. I always begin with the biology and the engineering first. What I say to the company is, if you can convince me on the biology and the engineering, don't worry about the regulatory. We'll figure out how to sell it to FDA or whatever other. Um, but it's not a common approach, unfortunately, in this industry. That makes sense to me. Uh, it, it, but you have to have that deep understanding of what's going on. Indeed, yes. Yeah, yeah. I saw that too when I was in the industry that a lot of the business development folks came from a very technical background. And I think that was when they were looking at partnerships or people to bring in, they could have that deep understanding. So, so I want to get to some of your international travel. What are some of the, what, what's been a very memorable cross-cultural experience that you've had? Well, first of all, you know, I haven't done really any travel for the last year since COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, uh, and actually, to be honest with you, that's not entirely a bad thing because, you know, fortunately, my business is doing well and I do business literally around the globe. So I wake up here in Southern California and I literally work my way around the earth, taking advantage of the different time zones. And I go from one Zoom meeting to the next, to the next, the next. So to be honest with you, I really don't miss getting on airplanes as much as I used to. <laughs> You're so much more productive this way. I think so. And, you know, because, uh, you know, before COVID, I was traveling a, a fair amount, perhaps not as many as some people, but, you know, sometimes as much as once a week. Uh, and, you know, that gets old very quickly. <laughs> so... Uh, so I'm not in any hurry to get back. On the other hand, because I haven't traveled since for the last year, I've, uh, I've lost my status with the airlines and with the hotels, so I don't get the, <laughs> the perks that I used to anymore. But, uh, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to everything. Um, yeah. 
But, uh, you know, one place that I used to go to an awful lot is to Ireland. Um, I've been to, to Galway, I think, like 46 times because there's a lot of medical uh, companies over there, as you can probably right. imagine. Uh, and there are, e even though in Ireland they speak English, uh, <laughs> there are obviously cultural differences between here in the U.S. and Ireland. And, um, you know, so that goes back to what we talked about earlier. I, you know, I, I, I used to get a kick out of when well, not necessarily a kick, but um, in, in many places in Europe, as I'm sure you know, it's very customary when you go out for dinner, including for a business dinner. You typically go out very late. In other words, they don't usually pick you up until like eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And then the dinner will go on in many cases for like many hours, right? And what amazes to me is, you know, then you got to go to work the next day, right? And I remember I was in a in a um, in a cab in in Ireland once, and I find cab drivers to be some of the greatest philosophers in the world. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember how this came up, but uh, I made a comment, you know, in in Ireland, you know, it, it, I don't know how, you know, people they they go to the pub every every night, and then they go to the to the to work the next morning. And I, you know, of course, this is a stereotype. I'm not trying to imply anything about my friends in Ireland. Things are changing, but I but I made this observation, and the uh, the the cab driver in his very very Gaelic heavy accent. He, he, he responded by saying, well, going to work isn't so important as going to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps, Wendy, there's a, 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 you know, I judge from your reaction, there's a funny story about some of the cultural differences that we run into in different places in the world. Oh, that is great. I love that story. The, uh, yeah, it is so true. If you get talking to your cab driver. I, I had an Uber driver, it was about a year and a half ago. She was a medical doctor. She was just kind of in transition to decided to do it. And I'm like, well, this is probably the most educated <laughs> cab driver I've ever had. But she was fascinating to talk I'm to. I'm assuming that she was probably not charging you at her physician rates. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was not. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a very enjoyable conversation with it. Uh, so how about your favorite foreign word? Favorite foreign word? You're hitting me with some interesting questions. Um, not your typical webinar podcast, huh? <laughs> yeah, definitely not. You're, yeah, you're like forcing to me to, to think. I'll, I'll have to, maybe in the next few th seconds I can think of one. I can't, I can't think of one at the moment. Okay, we'll go on to favorite vacation, but we're coming back to favorite foreign word because I know you got one. And, and, and foreign is very generous if it's a english irish word you know that is different that is fine but favorite vacation well you know my wife and i as i mentioned at the beginning you know we just moved here to southern california just uh just a couple of years ago um and we're still you know um exploring this part of the world so we don't really have the desire to go off you know on far distant places we used to do a lot of cruises prior to covid uh and we would like to go back to, to cruising again eventually, although I'm not sure that it's going to be anytime very, very soon. Um, fortunately for me, uh, when I travel on business, if I go to interesting places, um, sometimes my wife will come with me. For example, uh, several years ago, the, uh, the HSA, what uh, in, in, in Singapore, we, uh, the, the Singapore FDA, we, we, we call it the HSA, they invited me to come over to Singapore and spend a week with them, working internally with them, helping them to, to um, how do I want to say this, uh, to revamp their medical device and combination product regulatory framework. And uh, that was a terrific experience, and I brought my wife with me. And uh, so uh, she spent the time touring Singapore. And as a matter of fact, they were very, very uh, cordial when we were there. They actually assigned somebody to my wife to help her, you know, get around and so on. So very, very nice. So uh, oftentimes, you know, when I travel to an interesting place, when my when my wife is uh, is available, she'll come with. And I have to share with you a quick funny story, and then we can. I think wrap this up. Um, when I told uh, my uh, my nephew at the time, he was about uh, probably about seven or eight years old, that we were going to Singapore. He said, um, uh, he asked, are you going to drive there through the center of the earth? Because I told him it was on the other side of the earth. And I said, and Matthew at the time, I said, was about six or seven years. So I said, no, Matthew, we, we, we can't quite do that now, but maybe you can figure out a way to make that happen. 
That's the kind of an encouragement that we need to provide kids. You know, don't tell me something is impossible. Let's focus on a way to make it happen. Whether you're, you're talking about regulatory strategy and bringing a product onto the market here in the U.S. or somewhere else, or whether you're talking about, you know, driving from the U.S. to Singapore through the center of the earth. Don't tell me that something is impossible because that just drives me nuts. Let's figure out a way to make that happen. Is that a nice kind of a message to end this discussion on? Oh, Dr. Drews, that was such a perfect way to end this conversation. So I think that's perfect to think about going international. Is just, don't say you can't do it. Don't be afraid of doing it, but figure out a way that you can do it. And if you need a regulatory expert to do it, I definitely recommend you, Dr. Drews. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Wendy. It was that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate your recommendation. Uh, very, very honored to to speak with you and your audience. And if there's anything I can do to help in the future, by all means, feel free to to contact me. Okay. So why don't you tell people <clears throat> where they can find you and then spell your last name? Because it sounds like Drews, but it's spelled differently. Yeah. So my my name is Michael Drews. D is in David. R U E S. Uh, you can go to my LinkedIn site. You could go to uh, my company webpage, which is <clears throat> www.vascularsci. That's V-A-S-C-U-L-A-R-S-C-I.com. Uh, or to be honest with you, you can just Google my name because if you Google my name, you will come up with a laundry list of, of uh, the, the podcasts and webinars that I've done. And I suspect we can uh, post, you know, my contact information along with the information for, for today's discussion as well. Yes, we will do that in the link. And so Dr. Drews, and that was D as in David, R-U-E-S. You can find him in all those places. And it, uh, to me, he was fabulous to have, uh, to have you here to talk to today because it's just a different take on thinking about how you're going to expand re your regulatory aspect of your business and how you think it through. And don't start after you've launched in the U.S., but think of that very early. And that can apply across so many industries. So listeners, thanks for listening today. I uh, really appreciate it if you go to your favorite place where you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating today. That would be uh, wonderful if you could do that. And so we can have more people like Dr. Drews join us. Here's two thumbs up. <laughs> That's a wrap for this session. A big thanks to you for listening to the Global Marketing Show. Hope you had just as much fun as I did. New sessions launch weekly on all places you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and of course on our website. If you know someone interested in this topic, please tell them about us. Au revoir for now.